We have made it to the end, folks. Who is the next league-winning tight end in 2023? I've done quarterbacks. I've done running backs. I've done wide receivers already. But the tight end position is the one that gets forgotten about, the one that's often overlooked. But drafting a great tight end has its advantages. It can propel you over your league mates and help you win a championship. So last year when I made this vid, I actually had COVID. So I remember like powering through it and just getting it done. But today I should have a little bit more time to actually dive into some things. So if you guys get some value from this video, leave a like, subscribe at any point, all that good stuff. Now let's get into it. All right. So as I've talked about for the quarterbacks, running backs and wide receivers, I have, you know, different definitions of league winners at each position. My definition of a league winner at tight end is really two things. Number one, a tight end that was drafted early that produces like an elite win rate. So for example, Travis Kelsey last year, Mark Andrews, two years ago, you drafted that guy expecting them to be an elite positional advantage over the rest of the tight ends. And they absolutely were. Or number two, if you miss out on those early round tight ends, a guy that you got later on in your draft that turned into an, a, a set it and forget it every week starter. For example, guys like Evan Ingram last year, TJ Hawkinson last year. Those guys weren't as good as Travis Kelsey, obviously, but those guys were good enough to help you kind of set it and forget it at your uh, tight end spot. So I'm of the belief usually that you don't need a great tight end to win a championship. If you, the rest of your roster is very strong, you got a great quarterback, great running backs, great wide receivers. Usually I'm okay being weakest at this position more so than any other. We're definitely going to get into all the tight ends this year but first we're going to look at our sample of what makes a league winning tight end the anatomy of a league winning tight end is what we cover in this video series we're going to take the averages of past tight end league winners there's been 29 of them since 2013 from 2013 to 2022 so 10 year sample size who have finished with at least 14 plus PPR points per game so the other positions it was 20 plus with tight end it's 14 plus that would have made pretty much any tight end who had 14 or more points per game a top three season in points per game so these guys were truly you know set it and forget it dudes they had to have played at least 12 games or more in these seasons and you guys can see them on the screen last year the only guy that did it was Travis Kelsey two years ago we saw Andrews Kelsey and Kittle do it so on and so forth like I said there has been 29 of them since the year 2013 as always green means they ranked above average in most of the averages that we're talking about from a volume perspective here yellow about average and red below average so from a volume perspective these tight ends needed on average eight targets per game five and a half receptions per game just over half a touchdown per game on a paced average for 17 games that was 137 targets 95 catches and 10 touchdowns but volume isn't everything, especially at this position. You can definitely cut some corners. George Kittle, Tyler Eifert, Julius Thomas. These guys were not elite volume getters in the years that they finished as league winning tight ends, but they got there being on the back of, you know, massive touchdown totals or red zone opportunities or in George Kittle's case, elite efficiency over the past couple of years. So we're also going to look at situational factors that contributed to these tight end seasons. You can see, for example, Travis Kelsey having just an absolutely absurd season last year, best offense, best quarterback, top five team in pass attempts, elite you know, in team targets, he led his team in targets, led his team in touchdowns, all that good stuff. This position, more than any, you don't really need to be perfect. You don't really need to have everything going your way, but Travis Kelsey obviously did have that last year. Really talented options, guys in great offenses. You might only need one or two things going your way to have one of these seasons and every week starter and eventually a league winner at tight end. As you guys can see, the averages on the screen, on average, as a tight end uh, league winner, you needed to be in a top 10 offense. You needed to have a top eight quarterback and quarterback rating. You needed to be in in the top third of the league in team pass attempts, so your team needed to throw the ball quite a bit. On your team's target hierarchy, you basically wanted to be either the number one receiver or at least the number one A receiver or the number two receiver. Only two of the 29 guys that we're talking about here were not the first or the second target in their offense. So that's really crucial. We don't want to be targeting an offense's third and fourth options if they already have two established receivers ahead of them ahead of the tight end on the depth chart, there's a good chance that these guys don't have elite ceilings. Rank and receiving touchdowns, only one of the 29 were not first or second on their team in receiving touchdowns. Then we get into route participation. Only four of these tight ends were sub 70% route participation and all four of these tight ends were big time touchdown scores. So if you weren't on the field very often, you basically needed to run hot with touchdowns. Route participation was definitely a sticky stat. Only six of the 29 tight ends in this sample were below a 72% 
route participation. And the reason 72% is a reasonable number is because that number would have ranked top 10 in the NFL last year. So we don't want our tight ends in line blocking, not out there running routes. And in line percentage was also something I tested as well. Only seven of the 29 tight ends were in line more than 50% of the time. So typically we like our tight ends to be not from an in line alignment. If possible, we want them playing in the slot. We want them playing outside. We want them in the backfield, whatever. Playing in line usually lends itself to a lot of blocking snaps. And that's not what we want out of our uh, fantasy tight ends. Yards per run, of course, was also very important as well because you need to be efficient with your targets at this position, especially because you're not going to get you know, seven, eight, nine, ten targets a game like a top wide receiver would. You want to be efficient on the five to six targets, maybe seven, eight targets that you get per game. This is an extremely easy way to identify which tight ends have high ceilings or not, because if you can reasonably say that, you know, this tight end is going to be third on his team in targets or fourth on his team in targets, he's probably not a very good investment. I'm not huge in target competition being a huge deterrent for elite wide receivers. You guys have heard me talk about how I'm not worried about like the too many mouths to feed narrative for like Calvin Ridley or AJ Brown last year or whoever. But when you're a tight end and you're limiting your routes because there's a lot of great wide receivers on your team, it matters a lot more for you than it does for a stud alpha wide receiver for example. The reality is there isn't a ton of difference makers at this position from a talent perspective, so it matters a lot more for them. And on top of that, they're not running as many routes as wide receivers. So if you're not heavily involved in your offense, it means that you're probably not running a ton of routes. And typically when we look at these league winning ceilings, some of the seasons that I just broke down, it came from one of three paths. Number one, you wanted premier target potential, similar to guys like, you know, 2020 Darren Waller, Zach Ertz in recent years. Those guys got there on high end target, um, you know, potential. Number two was premier touchdown scoring ability, like we've seen from Jimmy Graham, like we've seen from Rob Gronkowski, like we've seen from uh, Tyler Eifert and Julius Thomas in recent years. Or the best case scenario is that you have both of those things, right? You have a combination of the two, which presents the Travis Kelsey ceiling, right? When you get the highest, you know, team scoring and touchdown, and you also get, you know, you're the, the number one receiver on your team and you're getting all the targets. That's when you really get those special seasons out of tight ends, like we've seen from Kelsey in recent years, like we've seen from Gronkowski in recent years, like we've seen from Mark Andrews in 2021. So we're going to go through this year's underdog ADP, the tight end position. We're going to determine basically who has high ceilings, who doesn't have a high ceiling, and we're going to go through all these factors with the anatomy in mind that we've kind of just broken down. So we're going to go from tight ends one to eight, nine to 16, and then 17 to 24 and talk about who has these type of ceilings. So we're going to start with tight ends one to eight. These are the guys that matter quite a bit. All, you know, eight of these guys or so are going inside the top 100 in ADP. The major question that anybody is going to have about Travis Kelsey is not whether he's the tight end one in fantasy because he absolutely is. There's literally, literally nothing wrong with his profile. He scores green across the board because he has the talent. He has the volume. He has the offensive production. He plays with Patrick Mahomes. His usage is absolutely unbelievable. He's used as the number one receiver for his team. He's running a high percentage of his team's routes. He literally checks every box. The only question that we have for Travis Kelsey is can he fail due to injury or can he fail due to maybe falling off from an old age perspective? For me, I'm very comfortable taking Travis Kelsey at the end of round one, even closer to the midpoint of round one, if I'm playing in best ball league specifically. But Travis Kelsey, for me, is a guy that I will pass up on if there's elite wide receiver and running back options on the board. For me right now, he's ranked as my 11th overall player. I'm comfortable getting him there. But if you have to take him 5, 6, 7th, 8th overall in your home leagues, I'm probably out on him at that cost. So uh, the reason is because I think Mark Andrews is kind of like a discount version of him. At cost, I definitely do prefer Mark Andrews. I have a higher percentage ownership on him versus uh, Travis Kelsey on underdog drafts for a reason because you can get Mark Andrews in mid-round 3 as opposed to tail end round one for still a very high projection of his team's targets. He definitely is still the number one receiver of his team. He has great usage, great red zone usage, elite talent. He has a good quarterback in Lamar Jackson. Offensive environment should improve with Todd Munkin coming in. And maybe the concern that some of you guys might have listening to this is that, you know, Zay Flowers, Odell Beckham Jr., Rashad Bateman, all these guys impact the target share of Mark Andrews. And in my opinion, Mark Andrews is still the alpha here. He's still the number one receiver. In fact, in his 2021 season, when he finishes the tight end one overall, when he actually outscored Travis Kelsey, the reason he did it is because the offense threw the ball a ton more. And if the offense is going to throw the ball a lot more this year than they have in recent years, then Mark Andrews has a higher ceiling than people think. And also in that season, Marquise Brown was a top 24 wide receiver in points per game. So there is still room if they throw the ball more for, you know, Zay Flowers to emerge or Rashad Bateman to emerge or Odell Beckham to emerge, whoever you like in that core, 
Don't get it twisted, though. It is still Mark Andrews as the leader of that um, of that clubhouse. The next tier of tight ends, we have TJ Hawkinson, George Kittle, Kyle Pitts. All of these guys kind of have things going in their favor with TJ Hawkinson. He projects to have the most volume of those three because he plays for the Vikings, who are going to throw the ball a lot more probably than the San Francisco 49ers and Atlanta Falcons will throw. But George Kittle and Kyle Pitts are probably more talented players than TJ Hawkinson. And also, they're used as you know true weapons as pass catchers. Kyle Pitts plays on the outside. He plays in the slot. He's used more like a wide receiver. And George Kittle is used in those high-value areas of the field, downfield, in the red zone, those type of areas. So my approach with this tier, Hawkinson, Kittle, and uh, Kyle Pitts, is honestly to just take the best value. If you see in your home league draft that TJ Hawkinson is a mid-round four pick and Kittle and Pitts are both on the board at like the end of round five, early round six or something like that, then definitely fade TJ Hawkinson in favor of those better values. But honestly, these guys uh, throw them into a hat and I think any one of them could finish as the tight end three, tight end two, to uh, potentially over those other guys. Dallas Goddard might be slightly overrated in my opinion, especially from a ceiling standpoint, because remember what I said earlier, right? If we can't reasonably project a tight end to be the number one or number two target on their offense, he's probably not going to have an elite ceiling. I feel confident that Ga Dallas Goddard can be a top eight tight end this year in fantasy, but he's not going to have that elite ceiling because AJ Brown is there, because Devontae Smith is there, both of whom are better players and better target earners than Dallas Goddard. It would take an injury to one of those two players for him to have a higher ceiling, but it it is a great offense. He has high touchdown potential, and that's something I want for my fantasy teams. Although I do think Goddard is probably somebody I'm not going to be pushing the button on very much this year. Darren Waller might be the best value of all of these options. I got to be honest, I didn't really expect to like Darren Waller this year. I thought everybody would be way too high on him. They would see that he went to the Giants and take him, you know, in the fourth, fifth round as an elite tight end. But that's not what's happened at all. Everybody is very injury concerned with Darren Waller. He hasn't been healthy the past couple of years. He's getting up there in age. And while that's still a concern for him, I'm absolutely not dismissing that. It's baked into his price. You're getting this guy in round seven, round eight. And if you gave me 15 plus healthy Darren Waller, games, I guarantee you he would outscore TJ Hawkinson. I guarantee you he would outscore George Kittle and Kyle Pitts and Dallas Goddard. The real concern we have for him is just injury. So if Darren Waller can stay healthy, I feel confident in my opinion that he is the clear number one of this team. The New York Giants have nobody else at wide receiver. Darren Waller is a proven target earner. He's been the number one of his offense before back in 2020 with the Raiders. And if this offense improves, if Daniel Jones improves in Dayball's second year as the head coach, then Darren Waller is going to be an absolute smash pick in round seven, round eight, where you're currently getting him. He might go a little bit earlier in home leagues because of name value, but also because he's been injured, he might go later in home leagues because people are sick of him. So definitely keep an eye on Darren Waller's ADP in your own league. I personally would take him in round seven, round eight. But if he goes a little bit earlier than that, then I'm probably going to be out on him and his price. And then the final guy of this tight end one to eight tier is Evan Ingram, who in my opinion is a poor man's Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard Again, he's not the number one or two for his team. Neither is Evan Ingram. I think Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk will both comfortably out-target Evan Ingram. But I also do love the fact that he has elite quarterback play. I do love the fact that he has good usage. He has high touchdown potential. They paid him instead of uh, letting him play on the franchise tag. So in my opinion, if you want Dallas Goddard, don't draft him. Just draft Evan Ingram two rounds later. It's basically the same exact bet, except you're getting a two-round discount and potentially an offense that'll throw the ball a lot more than the Philadelphia Eagles. So um, that is the tight ends one to eight range. It starts to get really ugly really fast here at this position. So bear with me. Tight ends drop off pretty quick, in my opinion, this year. I think last year I was a little bit more in on the tight end 6 to 13 range. This year, it's not quite as promising, at least from a ceiling perspective. I do still like some of these guys, David Njoku, Pat Fryermuth, and Greg Dolchich. Um, I, I would say these are some of the last tight ends that I would feel comfortable with drafting only one tight end. So if you only wanted to draft one tight end in your entire 15 round draft, I would say you need to draft a tight end, Greg Dolchich or better, uh, at least in these ADPs right now. All three of these guys have the ability to become the number two of their team. Behind Amari Cooper, David Njoku could emerge as the number two weapon. Behind Deontay Johnson, Pat Frymuth has been really the number two weapon for this Steelers offense. I don't really care about George Pickens. He's not out targeting Pat Frymuth. He hasn't been a high target share guy going back to his days in college and Pat Fryermuth, all he's done is command targets since he's been in the NFL and then Jerry Judy is going to comfortably out target Greg Dolchich but behind Jerry Judy I mean we saw Tim Patrick go down with an injury as I'm recording this it looked like it was an Achilles tear and then it's Cortland Sutton and a second round rookie and Marvin Mims I think Greg Dolchich could have a real role there and then they all kind of have their own warts though none of these guys have the ability probably to finish his top three options because you know David Njoku has not proven that he can be an alpha target earner quite yet um, you know 
Greg Dolchich has been really good from a usage standpoint, but how good is the Broncos offense going to be? Pat Fryermuth is a good target earner, but how good is Kenny Pickett going to be? So all of them have their notches. David Njoku probably has the best quarterback. Greg Dolchich showed probably the best usage. Top five in route participation as a rookie last year was extremely impressive. Pat Fryermuth is one of the best at commanding targets of this group. It really all depends what you're looking for, but all three are targets of mine. Then we get into the tight end 12 and ADP, which is Dalton Kincaid, a guy that is everybody hot and bothered right now because all the spreadsheet virgins are, you know, clamoring that rookie tight ends never produce. They're never going to work out. But let's look at the scoreboard because I will say that rookie tight ends have been better in recent years when we look at the fact that Kyle Pitts had a thousand yards as a rookie just two years ago. Um, Pat Fryermuth scored seven touchdowns as a rookie just two years ago. Greg Dolchich, like I just said, was top five in the NFL in route participation at the position. All rookie tight ends struggle in one facet, whether it's getting targets, getting you know consistent reps, getting on the field. That's what we saw with Chica Conco last year. If those rookies weren't on utter dog shit offenses like Pitts, Fryermuth, and Greg Dolchich were, they might have been league winners. If you drop those guys on the Buffalo Bills offense like Dalton Kincaid has been dropped onto... Um, we might have an opportunity for a guy to really, really return at ADP and finally give us a productive rookie tight end. If we monitor the usage and he gets it, right, if we look at preseason games and he's the starting tight end, he's getting used all over the formation, he could be the number two target for this Buffalo Bills offense. Uh, Josh Allen, who's going to throw the ball at, at will, they have an opening at slot receiver with Isaiah McKenzie leaving, and that's maybe why they drafted Dalton Kincaid. And their current number one in Stephon Diggs is doubled more than any other receiver in the NFL. So, you know, a lot of people talk a lot of shit about, you know, some people getting double covered all the time. Stephon Diggs is the only guy that actually really gets double covered a lot. And if that is going to continue to happen, that opens up the middle of the field for Dalton Kincaid, a guy that's a little bit of an older prospect, might have a, le- a little bit of an easier time adjusting to the NFL. So Dalton Kincaid, yeah, he's a rookie tight end and rookie tight ends don't usually produce, but look at the price tag, man. We're not taking this guy in round six or round five. We're taking this guy in round nine, round 10, where he's worth the upside swing. In my opinion, you have the potential to get the number two weapon for the Buffalo Bills offense. And because he's a rookie tight end, a lot of people will avoid him. So definitely keep an eye on Dalton Kincaid, somebody who's been a pretty decent target of mine in uh, b- uh, best ball drafts right now. Chica Conquo and Dalton Schultz are likely going to get held back by their offenses. Dalton Schultz, though, I will say, could be a number one or a number two option in his offense with Houston. So he's an interesting guy if you're going to completely punt the position. Chica Conquo is at best the number three receiver behind Hopkins and Traylon Burke, so I'm probably out on him. Tyler Higby also in this area is like Dalton Schultz. He could be the number two and cup can't do everything, although he probably will try pretty sexless pick. In my opinion, though, I'm not excited about drafting Tyler Higby. And I think if he's your best tight end option, you're probably going to be among the weakest in your league at that position. So I'm not excited about Higby, but I do like him in best ball because I do think he can get volume. And then Gerald Everett, in my opinion, is just like cheaper, but better Chica Conquo because both guys are not going to be the number one or two on their teams, but Everett is playing in an offense. That's going to throw the ball a lot more. He has Justin Herbert as his quarterback instead of Ryan Tannehill. And both guys are relying on efficiency and touchdowns to get there from a uh, tight end perspective. So give me Gerald Everett at a way less cost than uh, we get with Chiga Conquo. Then we get to the tight end 17 to 24. And I really will not spend a lot of time on these guys because they're not very good. Just mid as far as the eye can see. Cole Komet can command targets, but I do not trust the Bears offense to up the pass volume this year. Taysom Hill is definitely a wild card because we don't know how he's going to be used. If he's getting, you know, five, six, seven carries a game like he was getting last year, and you can play this guy at your tight end spot, the biggest hurdle for tight ends is usually to get on the field and touch the ball. So the fact that Taysom Hill is getting design touches as much as he is definitely bodes well for him. He is one of my highest rostered tight ends in all of underdog drafts because I think spike week wise, he is a really good option. Then we get into Sam Laporta, who's like a poor man's Kincaid. Again, both rookie tight ends, but he could be an integral part of this offense. We're already hearing that he's running with the first team quite a bit. So uh, Sam Laporta, another one that we want to monitor in the preseason and see how good his usage is. I'm sure he'll climb up boards if it's good. Then we have, you know, people I'm just not interested in. Irv Smith, Juwan Johnson, Dawson Knox, Mike Kosicki, Tyler Conklin, even guys going after this like Trey McBride. All those guys are like best ball only options if you're building out a three tight end core. But my favorite of those guys is Tyler Conklin, considering Garrett Wilson's really the only show in town there in New York. So when we score out these tight ends, again, uh, you guys can see the scoring thing, the scorecard that we did for quarterbacks, running backs, and wide receivers. We're doing the same thing here. You can kind of see it highlights who my targets are. Um, In green, again, you see Kelsey and Andrews and Hawkinson and Kittle and Waller all scoring with green. 
green scores here. My biggest targets given current costs, because again, these guys are not all created equally. Travis Kelsey, you have to spend a first round pick on. And Mark Andrews, I can get a similar 90 to you know 95% of what Travis Kelsey offers, but I can get him way cheaper. I can get him in the mid third round as opposed to the late first round. So for me, I'm fading Travis Kelsey currently and taking Mark Andrews on the cheap. TJ Hawkinson, a guy that I'm probably also fading because he goes a considerable round and a half ahead of George Kittle and Kyle Pitts, and I'll probably take those guys instead. Uh, I am very much targeting Darren Waller when he's available in round seven to eight. I'm fading Dallas Goddard and taking Evan Ingram later because I view those guys as similar projections. And then if I miss out on all of those guys, I probably want one of David Njoku, Pat Fryermuth, Dalton uh, Kincaid, or Greg Dolchich. But if I take Dalton Kincaid, I'll probably want to pair him up with a safer option like uh, Dalton Schultz or you know Cole Komet or Tyler Higby or somebody like that. But that is basically my strategy for this position. But this is how I'm approaching the tight end position. I'm usually more likely to deviate off of wide receivers and running backs because, again, in rounds one to seven, run, rounds one to eight, I want to be drafting a ton of wide receivers. I want to be drafting a couple running backs here and there. And if I'm going to deviate off of those positions for an elite onesie, it's usually going to be quarterback. But I will say, when I dug into the win rate data of elite tight ends since 2017, 55 tight ends have been drafted inside the top six rounds of ADP since 2017. 29 of those 55 tight ends or 52.7% of them have busted uh, or, you know, achieved a sub 8.33% win rate, which again, 8.33, one out of 12, inherently in a 12 man league, you have a one in 12 chance of winning. If a tight end is giving you less than an 8.33% win rate, it means that they were hurting your team. 18 out of those 55 or 32% busted really hard, giving you a sub 7% win rate. So basically when you look at early round tight end, top six round tight ends, you have a one in two chance of drafting a solid option, a one in three chance of drafting a guy that's completely awful. And again, about a one in three chance of drafting a guy that's really good. The data on quarterbacks was actually not that much different. So while I thought, you know, the data is going to tell me that drafting elite quarterbacks is way better than drafting elite tight ends, they actually busted about half the time as well, elite quarterbacks, and they busted hard about 31% of the time. So it wasn't that much more advantageous to go after elite quarterbacks than it was elite tight ends. Initially, I was expecting to take the approach, at, I'm not going to draft elite tight ends yet again. I would rather draft an elite quarterback and fill out the tight end position later. But actually, the win, wins over replacement is not really that distinguishable. Both both onesies are fine. If you want to deviate off of drafting, you know, five wide receivers and two running backs through the first eight rounds, if you want to take one pit stop to grab an elite tight end or grab an elite quarterback, there isn't really much difference between doing the two things. Last year, it would all depend on, you know, micro player takes. If you deviated for Kelsey, obviously, that would be great. But if you deviated for Andrews, it didn't work out quite as well. So last year, I came on here and I told you to favor the early quarterback. But realistically, it's not a major difference. I will say, though, that if you draft an elite tight end, you probably can't overspend at quarterback also and vice versa. If you draft an elite quarterback, I probably wouldn't overspend at tight end unless you're in a very shallow league format. That's going to really put you behind the eight ball at running back and at wide receiver. It really all depends which one falls at value. So hopefully this wasn't too confusing. Hopefully you guys got some value from this video. Hopefully I gave you an idea of which tight ends you should be drafting in fantasy football this year. If you got some value from this video, go down below, leave a like. Who's talking tight ends this in depth? Subscribe to the channel uh, if you guys are new around here for more tight end coverage and more uh, fantasy football content in general and also if you want access to our overall rankings the guys that I'm targeting the guys that Danny's targeting who we're higher on you know our positional rankings our tiers everything that you guys could want our contextualized game logs that tell you you know how good was Stefan Diggs when Josh Allen was healthy how good was CeeDee Lamb when Dak Prescott was healthy all that is available in our redraft rankings manifesto 2.0 and you can get access to that for just ten dollars all you have to do is go to underdog fantasy deposit 10 bucks using the promo code fse which you can then win money with and you'll also get our uh, redraft rankings manifesto 2.0 for free and in season you'll get our weekly rankings for free so you can help uh, we, so we can help you out with all of your start sit decisions and all that good stuff so if that interests you check out the link down below in the pinned comment and if you already have an underdog account or you can't play underdog in your state and you still want access to our redraft rankings manifesto you can get that on our site flockfantasy.com use code fse for 30 percent off over there if you sign up annually right now you can get a free zoom consultation with myself or with danny but with that being said peace out and we'll talk to you soon